begun. Okay, alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathiran. Thank you everybody for your patience. I am sorry for being a little late today. I actually was recording another class uh, that went over uh, a few minutes and so I um, quickly messaged uh, Sister Romero. She messaged me actually uh, and I let her know that I'll be a little late. So I appreciate your patience. Um, I want to uh, get started with, uh, as we have been, doing a little bit of a review. So let's talk about uh, some of the diseases that we covered last week, inshallah, okay? So uh, let me actually open up the chat box, make sure you guys are all listening and paying attention, inshallah, okay? Uh, oh, you guys are so sweet with your comments, thank you. So the uh, first uh, disease I'm going to ask you about, okay? This is when you, um, when you think things that aren't necessarily true and one of the hadith that were taught about this is that the tongue will wake up every morning and tell the body to fear Allah. Uh, what disease of the heart did we learn that talks about negative thoughts and you know this uh, ability of the tongue to take you into that um, direction? Okay, there we go, mashallah. So we got Afnan and Bilal. Very good. Both of you, Afnan and Bilal, uh, messaged pretty much the same time with the correct answer. So negative thoughts, I kind of gave it away in my, um, I, I subtly put that in there to see if you guys are paying attention, but you answered before that anyway. So negative thoughts is a disease of the heart, and this is called su'adhan or su'adhan, okay? So when you have, basically, there's no evidence, there's no proof whatsoever, you just have a a bad idea of someone, right? So that is called so then. And okay, so great. I'm glad you guys are on it. Now, um, this disease of the heart uh, has to do with, let's see, I'm going to try to keep it a little uh, not so predictable because I see some of you think you're already putting in answers before I ask. So that tells me you think I'm too predictable, <laughs> which I probably have been. Um, but okay, so let me see here. Um, for this, okay, let's see, this, now I'm going to get you. This, when we talked about this hadith, we related a hadith or a saying, I should say, a quote by Imam Ali, uh, radiallahu an, and he said that people are asleep and when they die, they wake up. Which disease of the heart related to that, to that quote? Awesome. Mashallah, Zoya and Dania, you guys got it right away. Great job. False hopes, tul al amal. Okay, so uh, thinking that you're going to live forever, right? That's the problem with it's a disease of the heart. If you think that you're going to live forever, it makes you careless and heedless, which we're going to talk about today uh, in this world. And it's kind of like you're walking around asleep. You're not really uh, awake to the world, right? You're you're in a dreamlike state because you're not paying attention to what's really going on in front of you. So very good awesome you guys okay uh now this disease of the heart um had to do with suspicion and not being suspicious of people right having thoughts about people for no uh reason right just thinking uh or wanting to um uh, look into prying right prying behavior being suspicious you're trying to find out information about people with really no reason um so let's see who got this very good so rahil excellent negative thoughts i went back to the same one i'm not gonna be predictable you guys <laughs> okay, good job. You got it. So you might get a question uh, or m multiple questions on the same disease. Okay. So this disease of the heart has to do, and the Prophet Sallallahu taught us that it's very much related to kibir. Okay. So this disease is related to kibir and which we'll talk about soon, but um, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us that no one has the weight of a seed of, of, this particular quality in their heart will enter paradise. What is it? Okay, very good. So Amen uh, and Uthman, you gave us the English, which is vanity. Very good. 
Um, and Bilal also gave us the English, but uh, Lala Haidara, she came with both answers. So great job, vanity and ajib, okay? So uh, anytime you're vain, right? Being vain is, is uh, being consumed with self-adoration. Adoration is like you admire yourself, you adore yourself, you love yourself. That's vanity. And so it's really about the individual and themselves, and you're not giving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any credit for anything. You're just, oh, I love myself. I'm so smart. I'm so talented. I'm such a good basketball player. I'm such a good tennis player. Or I can play the piano or I dress so nicely. I have such nice hair. So you're just constantly f very focused on all of your qualities, but you don't give credit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is ajib. Um, and then kibir, which is what the Arabic word for one of the diseases of the heart, which we're going to talk about next week, is arrogance, right? And arrogance is, um, is requires, so it's different in that it requires other people. So a, a vain person is just very consumed with their own feelings of importance. But an arrogant person is not only vain, but they also look down on other people. So that's the way that you tell the difference, that uh, vanity doesn't require people. Arrogance does, but they both can sometimes affect each other or one can certainly lead to it, the other. If you are vain and you keep, you know, increasing in arjub, you're likely going to develop arrogance, right? Where you start to look down on people. And so that's why we talked about uh, that hadith. Very good. Um, okay. And so another question, and this will be the last one, and then we'll continue. Um, let's see here. Bismillah. Let me give you a good one. One that is not so predictable. Hmm. Okay, so the Prophet said, and we talked about a hadith here uh, where, where um, he taught us that he who believes in Allah and the last day must either speak good or remain silent. Which disease of the heart was that about? Which disease of the heart did we cover when we talked about that? Anybody know? Very good. Okay, awesome. So Ahsan came with the answers to the negative thoughts. Yes. To uh, have negative thoughts, remember the danger of it is that it often leads to false speech or wrong speech. And so uh, that's why we related this hadith is because usually you can't keep negative thoughts to yourself. So it actually is, is dangerous in and of itself as a disease, but it also leads to other diseases like gossiping and backbiting and speaking ill of people. So that's why this hadith is remind, it's a reminder for us that whoever believes in Allah in the last day, if you're a Muslim, but just speak good. Don't speak uh, ill of people. So it stops the negative thoughts from, from leading into even worse. Um, okay, very good. All right, so let's go ahead uh, and pull up the presentation. Uh, one second, I just needed to do something. All right, so get your, um, if you have notes, or if you're taking notes, I don't know if you are, but this is the time to get it because we have a new presentation. And let me get that ready. Bismillah. So we are on week thir three Thursday, and here we go. Screen share, boom, share, and present. Okay, here we go. All right, so you guys ready? So today, as we talked about last on Tuesday, I told you guys we're going to cover these diseases this week. So we already covered the first three, false hope, negative thoughts, and vanity. And now we are going to cover the next three, fraud, ghish, anger, ghadab, heedlessness, ghafla. So we got the G's today, okay? Today is the day of the G diseases, okay? <laughs> For Arabic anyway, or ghain, not G, I should say ghain. So ghain diseases, okay? And we'll talk about what each of these are. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first one, fraud, ghish. This is a huge one, okay? Huge, because a lot of people, uh, when they, you know, uh, think about, you know, making money or just getting ahead in life, they, shaitan will come into their hearts and tell them, you know, to do things that are not right, just because the greed or the desire for that thing just overtakes their heart. And this is the problem with fraud is that it, it leads people to do things that are haram. For example, if you're, let's say you're selling something, right? Um, and some of you may know, for example, there's a, a website called 
Craigslist, okay? And now we have a lot more websites, but this is just a popular website, okay? That a lot of adults um, use to sell things that they don't want. So they may sell like junk, you know, but it's the way that they take the picture or describe that thing. Let's say it's a piece of furniture, okay? Let's say it's a couch. And um, a person will take the nicest picture, filters, you know, make it look super amazing. And they'll take the front of that couch and it looks like a decent couch and they set the price. And now you have all these people going, Ooh, that sounds nice. Okay. I'm interested. And, um, and someone may even come and say, I'm going to pick it up. And then that person, if they're, if they have rich, what they'll do is they'll do a few things. Okay. First of all, they're hiding the problems in the couch, which may be the back of the couch. Maybe there's marks that they've painted over uh, with, with paint or there's gashes. You know, sometimes couches, if they're leather or fabric, they can have, you can, you know, things can happen and they get cuts. So this person may have completely hidden all of those things. And what they'll do is if they're really crafty, they'll say, you know what, um, pick up time. You can only come at nighttime. Okay. Come at like after uh, the sunset and the, the the buyer has no idea why right the buyer's like okay if that's the only time that works for you that's fine so they go and they go and at nighttime they're dragging this big couch from the garage or wherever onto the car so they're not even able to properly inspect the uh, couch right this happens a lot and then they they make the money transfer they give the cash and now they go home and they go on their couch and they're thinking it's gonna look just like that picture, right? It had, uh, it looked really nice and comfortable, but they suddenly sink in the cou couch and all of a sudden the cushions collapse, right? The cushions go down and there's all these, you know, maybe noises. And then they're going, what, what's up with this couch? It's not even comfortable. And then they go around the back or they turn it, flip it upside down. And all of a sudden there's all these holes and problems and maybe even, you know, cobwebs, God knows. It might be just, like I said, a piece of junk that this person took so much time to present as something that it wasn't. So I just, you know, that's a piece of furniture, but people can do this to a lot of things like a car or even a house. There's people who scam, right? This word scam, you should know. To be scammed is to trick someone, to uh, have someone sell you something that is not real or not true or not as good as they're making it seem. So there's a lot of scammers that will scam people out of big purchase things, right? Cars, homes, jewelry. So you'll go to the jeweler and it'll, uh, this has actually happened before, which is very, you have to be very careful if you, if you ever get jewelry or like, you know, uh, especially gemstones or, or certain stones to be careful who you take that jewelry to, to clean it. If it's a real diamond, for example, there are some jewelers who are known to do this. They will um, take your ring and go, oh, I'll clean it, but my tools are in the back, right? And you're just standing around waiting for them to bring you your diamond all polished and nice and shiny, but they're thieves. They know exactly how to remove that diamond really well. And then they'll go in the back and they'll replace it with like a totally different false, you know, stone, uh, cubic zirconium. There's all these different stones that can be um, mistaken for uh, a real diamond. And if you don't have a, a jeweler's eye or a tool, uh, I forgot what they're called, to actually look at the diamond, you would have no idea that that was not your diamond because it looks just the same and it fits perfectly into the ring or the necklace or whatever it was, the earrings. So there are people who do things like that. They trick, they scam, they steal, and they justify it because they're greedy and they have desires for material things that take over them. So you have to be very careful. And that's why, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns people, woe to those who give less than what to do. So this is a perfect example of someone who has rish. So if you go and, uh, you know, in, in many world markets, and even in some markets here, like if you've been to Sprouts, right? Um, they have those scales that you can uh, go and weigh your, uh, like if you want to get certain treats or even beans and rice, you can weigh the, the item, right? Um, and then you, uh, you, um, you go and purchase it. Well, in other places, they have scales and have similar things, but they might not 
give you the full weight uh, of what you paid for, or they might take some off, or they might not give you the best quality of what you want. And they justify this because it's like, oh, I don't want my you know uh, food to go bad. I have to sell it. So it's old. Let's say it's like meat or it's something that's been sitting out for a couple of days. They will mix stuff, uh, good stuff, bad stuff with the good stuff. And you don't know until you get home. And then you take out, let's say it's like a bag of fruits, right? And you take it out and you're like, what? There, why are all these rotten fruits in here? How did this happen? Well, that seller, they tricked you, right? So this is a perfect example of a rish, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning never to do that. There's no justification to trick people. It's haram. You cannot do that. And so there's actually a very famous hadith um, where the Prophet ﷺ was once passing by a pile of food uh, and he put his hand into it and his fingers touched something. So he was in a market, you know, and he he saw some food and he, he put his hands into it and he asked the person, he said, what is this? And the man said, it got rained on because he the Prophet ﷺ touched um, the wet part, right? And so when he touched the wet part, he was wondering why the seller, you know, why it was there in the first place. What was this wet thing? And the seller said, oh, well, rain got on it. And he said, why didn't you put that wet part on top of the pile so that the people could see it, right? Because if you see food that is dry from the top, but then the middle of it is spoiled or wet, you probably would not want to get the middle of it. But if you're just scooping it up quickly and you're not paying attention, it looks like all of it is dry, right? So he's telling the man, why didn't you do that? And then he tells him very clearly a warning. He who deceives does not belong to me. And then another report is he who deceives is not one of us, or he is not one of us who deceives. All of them are saying the same thing, which is if you trick people, to deceive people is to lie, to trick people, you are not counted as part of the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. He's telling you, you're not in my ummah, you're not part of me, you're not part of my this belief, this faith of Islam. Clear warning, we as Muslims do not trick people, it's haram, okay? Such an important disease of the heart and we should uh, ask Allah to free us from it because shaitan can make someone justify this, especially if they're desperate for money, you really need something, you might think, oh man, it's okay. They don't need to know that, you know, this phone, let's say you, you're trying to sell your phone or your computer, that it has all these problems and that there's a virus on it and that, you know, it's missing a button. I'm just going to sell it anyway, you know? Don't do that. You can never do that. You have to p tell people everything that's wrong with the item uh, up front. And if they still want to buy it, that's on them. But you trying to deceive them into buying it is totally forbidden. Okay. All right. So the treatment for Rish is to realize that Allah subhanahu wa is all knowing and all seeing and every single thing that we do, we're going to be held accountable for. And nothing that you get, no money, no food from fraud is worth it. It actually is haram. It's, it's, it's going to cause you harm. Okay. Anything that you get that's uh, that you get from a haram source or because you did something haram, there's no barakah in it. And it, it can actually cause problems for you. You could, if you bought food with that money that you just cheated someone out of, it can make you sick. Um, there's so many problems that could come from that money or whatever you got from this transaction. So that's why there's no barakah in it whatsoever. And there's no point to do it. You actually could invite harm on yourself. Even if you think, oh, I'm going to make so much money and I'll do good with it. Part of it. No, the fact that you got it to tr by tricking another person, all of it is ruined. Okay. So you don't want to uh, ever justify um, that kind of stuff. And then also remember that the words of the Prophet said him that, you know, to st for him to say that you're not from among us or from me is such a clear warning, the Billah, that we would not even be considered a Muslim if we do something like this. So you want to say, is it ever worth it? You know, even if I'm going to make some quick money and I really want to get something else, um, it, or, in, or I think that, oh, it's okay, this person doesn't need to know everything. These are all the whisperings of shaitan. He wants you to do something wrong, and then he wants you to be uh, 
you know, hurt by that thing. So we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection. But that's the first disease, it's rish. Okay. All right. So the next disease. This is a big one, okay? Ghadab, anger. Uh, we all know what anger is. Even young children can get angry, right? Anger is a human emotion, and it's something that can be easily triggered based on a lot of things. Sometimes we get uh, hangry, for example. If you're fasting in the month of Ramadan and you've ever just gotten annoyed or short-tempered uh, because of, for really no reason, it's likely because you're hangry, you're hungry and you're angry at the same time. So anger can come from that or it can, can come from someone uh, provoking you. To provoke someone is to, you know, push their buttons, to get them annoyed, to be a pest and you're just trying to make them angry, right? So there's a lot of things that can make us angry, but when we, when anger is a problem, it's when it's for other than the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because there's good anger, which is necessary, right? There's anger when someone is doing something wrong and it's a clear, uh, you know, uh, you know, wrong action and, and an injustice towards a, a person or a group of people, you, we should, that should anger us for the sake of Allah. We should not look uh, at that as, as something light. And then that makes us uh, call. I mean, it makes us uh, act, right? So when you see someone, let's say, being bullied in front of you and you know that it's wrong, if your response is anger for the sake of Allah, then you go in there and you try to stop the injustice, right? So that's a form of healthy anger. Anytime, or, or anger towards things that are, are haram, right? Like for example, uh, the existence of certain things in the world should anger us, like alcohol. Alcohol, there's no benefit to it whatsoever. It destroys lives. Um, so many people, innocent people have died from alcohol. So the fact that alcohol exists and that people drink it and that it's in restaurants and it's in stores, that should anger us. When we do walk down the aisle of a, a grocery store and we see bottles and bottles of disgusting alcohol, it should fill our hearts with anger for the sake of Allah. You know, not anger where you're just letting your emotions out, but just like, astaghfirullah, why are people doing this? This is so bad for you and it ruins, uh, you know, uh, people's lives. So anger is uh, is something again that when it's for the sake of Allah it's healthy but if it's for other things that are not tied to the sake of Allah and it gets out of control and you start to not just be uh, experience anger but you become anger that that's all you are you lose your 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 sense of uh, calm you don't know how to you, you don't have adab you start to maybe say very hurtful things uh, abusive things or you start to get physical right there's people who when they get really angry they lose so much control that they may physically uh, react and that could be hitting something or someone pushing something throwing something breaking something so all of those are examples of when anger is out of control and it can be very dangerous right and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophet them throughout the quran and the hadith we have warnings about those who are quick to anger and that let forget themselves and that they uh, completely get overtaken by anger. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes, he says, those who spend in the cause of Allah during ease and hardship and who restrain anger and who pardon people, who forgive people, and Allah loves the doers of good. So he's describing for us who the doers of good are. The people who do good are the ones who restrain their anger, who forgive people, and who uh, spend, uh, you know, for the sake of Allah, whether they have ease or hardship. So these are all great qualities that people should have, especially restraining your anger. Another um, two hadith that are really important to know. A man once came, asked the Prophet I said, what was the worst thing that one incurs concerning God? What that means is, you know, what is the worst thing that could happen to someone uh, to make Allah upset, right? Um, and the and the or what could what's the worst thing that someone could receive from Allah? And the Prophet said, His wrath. And his wrath, uh, you know, of course, is 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 his chastisement, his punishment, right? So the man asked, 
how can we avoid it? I don't want ever to see the wrath of Allah. I don't want to ever be punished by Allah. And he said, do not become angry. So he's telling us that if you don't want to see Allah's anger and wrath, do not become angry as, as you know, people where you're just walking around always mad and you're uh, pushing people and hurting people and just being cruel because that's what angry people do. They start to just be very careless and uh, just hurt people, right? So um, he's telling us clearly, don't become angry. Then we have another man. He came and asked the Prophet, so he said, give me advice. And so he's asking the prophet, like he, in, remember the prophet could say anything, anything to this man. The man just said, give me advice. But the first thing the prophet said is do not become angry. So the man's like, okay. And he, um, you know, he hears it. And then he says, um, well, what's next, right? Because he's kind of like, okay, I got that. Don't be angry. So he asks again and the, and the prophet replies again, do not become angry. And then he asks a third time. And again, the Prophet says, do not be become angry. So this is huge because the Prophet is really trying to get a message across that if you want good advice, the best advice, this is the advice to live by. Do not become anger such that all people see is your rage and you lose control because that control that you lose can lead to a lot of harm people have died because someone's lost their control you know this is, happens all the time in this world where someone lost their control their anger got the best of them and then they uh they killed right because of that and so there's so many stories throughout, uh, you know, the seerah of that happening as well. And even the, the story of the sons of Adam, you know, Habil and Qabil, if you study the story of the sons of Adam, that, you know, uh, Qabil is the one who killed his brother out of anger and jealousy. So this is very powerful uh, reminders for us that human nature, if we don't control these emotions, a lot of uh, damage can be done, right? So you always want to think about not losing yourself to anger. There's nothing wrong with having anger as an emotion because it's a human emotion, but it should always be for the sake of Allah, inshallah. Okay, so let's look more at this because this is certainly not over. One of the um, scholars or scholars have uh, said that, that anger is similar to a hunting dog, okay? So if you look at this picture here, here's a man and he has, I believe it's a hawk maybe. It's a bird of prey. I don't know exactly what, maybe it's a, I don't know, my sons might know, uh, but it's a hawk or some bird. And then you have these three dogs. And if you see, what is the man doing? He is holding them all by a leash. He is restraining those dogs. Those dogs move by his command. When he tells them to go, they go. When he releases the leash, they, he, uh, they, they go. And when he tells them to come back, they come back. That's the relationship that a man, a hunter has with his dogs or his animals that hunt before him. They're trained. They know exactly when to act and when to stop back, right? Step back. So anger, the uh, scholar said, is like having a hunting dog, right? Without training. And if you have a dog that can hunt, but there's no training, it's never going to go and get what you need it to get. And it's not going to point you in the right direction. So it's of no benefit to you. The dog that is trained will benefit you. When you hunt and you, let's say, you know, you're, um, there are people who hunt for food. You know, they don't have grocery stores like we do. They actually have to go outside and, you know, bow and arrow or gun or whatever they're using, they hunt for their food. And what they do is... <clears throat> Uh, they rely on animals to go and gr 
capture the food, right? These sharp, uh, they have sharp eyes, right? These birds of prey, uh, the falcon, the hawk, uh, whatever it is, it will be able to, the eagle, it will be able to, uh, you know, basically uh, fly around the, the area of where that animal was, was hunted. So if a, a man, you know, uses his bow and arrow or a gun and he shoots down an animal um, from a far distance, this hawk or this bird will be able to let the dogs know where to go, right? So they all work in this amazing, uh, you know, sort of synchronicity together. But the dog is important because he's the one or, or she's the one, if it's a, a female dog, that is going to go and get the animal that you just hunted and then bring it back to the hunter. But if that dog isn't trained, it will have no idea what to do. It's going to go running around all over the place and playing a game of fetch. And you're standing there going, that's my dinner. Can you please go get the animal I just hunted? If you're really, this is your lifestyle, right? So you need a trained animal. So anger in a similar way, it's only useful if you have control over it and you've trained it. It's actually harmful and doesn't benefit you if you don't train it. So it's so important. What a great analogy that our scholars gave us. So inshallah, think about this next time you get angry. Is your uh, hunting dog out of control? And is it benefiting you at all if, it's, uh, if you can't call it back? Because if you can control your anger, Similarly, like blowing a whistle or maybe calling the name of your animal, it will come back to you. But if you have no control and that animal doesn't answer to your call, then that's what anger can become if it's not checked, okay? So a really important um, disease of the heart to understand. Now, there's a few different cures, okay, or ways to, uh, to treat this. So <clears throat> first and foremost, Imam al-Mawlud, he talks about this uh, in the book, but um, also other scholars have talked about this, is to remember that extensive praise and goodness associated, um, oh wait, did I, did I cut and paste the wrong thing? Hold on. Uh-oh, sorry. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 I read it totally wrong. I apologize. Okay. So the first cure is to remember that there's a lot of praise associated with being a forbearing person and having humility. To be forbearing is to be patient, that you're able to, uh, you know, not give into those emotions and just have a really stable presence. So we know that there's so much praise for that. So remember, it's really good to have those qualities. And then, um, <clears throat> Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, which is another very famous scholar, said that the main reason that people get angry is because they're filled with themselves. Their egos get in the way. So you, our egos, our nafs, when it is uh, very, um, you know, too strong, it gets in our way, right? So we have to just kind of let go, not allow that every word someone says to us or everything that they do that may bother us, that it pushes our buttons and that it makes us... Uh, triggered, right? Uh, that we suddenly feel all these, uh, this anger towards them because um, people are, that's just life. You know, this world is uh, full of a lot of people. We have 8 billion people and some people you're going to get along with and some people you're not um, going to get along with, right? And so some people are going to make you happy. Some people are going to make you mad and angry, but you have to be in control of your emotions and not just, you know, go this way or that way. You have to say no, unless it's for the sake of Allah, I'm not going to just let people constantly make me angry. I need to use my own brain, right? So very important. Now, uh, the next cure that Imam al-Mawlud uh, recommends is, re is recognizing that nothing takes place without Allah's permission. There's no power or might except with Allah. So remember that, and to also remember, right? So that everything, what that means is that everything that happens is because Allah allowed it to happen. And so if you're being tested in a moment where someone or something is upsetting you, it's an opportunity for you to be the best uh, form of yourself, right? And so look at it as a test from Allah. Instead of focusing on the individual or the person who's bothering you, look at it like, why did Allah put me in this situation in the first place? Uh, what am I supposed to learn from this lesson? And then you act, right? Um, and so, and he also shared that 
remember that um, there, whatever we do in this world, Allah will also do that to us. So this is called reciprocity. If we are people that are walking around angry and not nice uh, to people and, and you know ha have that, Allah will show us the same. He will show us his anger. So we have to be very careful. We don't ever, 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 ever want to see the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should not be, as the Prophet warned us in the hadith before, we should not be people who are angry and who are, uh, so that we don't get Allah's wrath, right? So these are just some of the things to think about. There's a few other things that we can do. So we're taught, the Prophet taught us that when we are angry, of course, there are certain things that um, we can do in the moment, right? And in the moment, we should learn how to respond. So the Prophet taught us that if we're, uh, you know, angry and we're standing up, we should sit down. Okay, so sit down immediately because just by changing your position can sometimes change your mood, right? You can be a little bit more relaxed. Plus, if you think about it, when someone's angry and they're standing up, it makes them feel very powerful because you're big, you're puffing yourself up and sometimes you're, you know, standing a little taller and looking a little bit more aggressive, you know, when you're when you're uh, t say, uh, talking to the other person who's upsetting you, you might even um, go closer to them to look more scary and intimidating. Uh, or maybe even if you lose your control completely, you'll, you'll want to push them or do something, harm them, right? All of that can come because just because you're standing up and you're feeling like that, right? So when you change your position and you sit down, it can calm your state. Now, if you're sitting and you're angry, then you go into a lying down position. It's really awkward to be super angry if you're lying down. Okay. Uh, and I don't uh, want you to, um, to, to do that, uh, like intentionally, but maybe it just for practice, just to try to see how it feels when you're lying down to pretend even to be upset with someone. It feels awkward because lying down is such a relaxed position, right? So, um, that's what we should do. And then we should seek refuge in Allah, right? We say, Al Billahi mina shaitan al rajim. We uh, try to stay quiet. And then we're told to make wudu. Uh, wudu is very powerful because it has a cooling effect. Anger is, uh, it gets us hot, right? It's our blood pressure actually goes up. Our temperature goes up when we're angry because the heart is beating faster. So there's a lot of physical uh, things that are happening. So once you go and you make wudu, that cooling effect of the water just calms you down and suddenly you're able to maybe think better about what you said and you know you kind of just have a better response or maybe you're calmer so make will do and then ultimately the best thing to do is to pray you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance for control for forgiveness because if you said things that you didn't mean or regret you need to go and ask for forgiveness from Allah first and then from the person or the people. So all of these are ways that we can be in the habit of practicing our, uh, to get uh, down from that state of anger and also breathing. I didn't write it here, but breathing is very important, right? Um, when you're in a state of heightened emotion, when you're really, really angry, just take a deep breath, hold it in let go. That can immediately calm you down. Just forcing yourself to change your position and everything you're, because otherwise your words are just going to keep coming. And like I said, the anger is my, it's like a flame. It just grows more and more. So this is a way of calming all that down. Okay. Um, so here we say, um, okay. Now, this is a, I know a little interesting image I found, but I thought it worked perfectly with this hadith. Once a man grew angry and the Prophet ﷺ noticed how when the face shows extreme anger, it resembles shaitan, right? So he said, I have a word. If spoken, we'll remove it from him. It is I seek refuge in God from Satan the accursed, which is the English for Audhu Billahi Min Shaitan Al Rajim. So this picture I thought was perfect because he's a man, but look at what's happening to him. 
His face is turning red. Look at the veins in his forehead. He has steam coming out of his ears. His teeth uh, are looking sharp and quite scary. He's even frothing at the mouth, right? Um, which is, yeah, someone said it looks <laughs> ridiculous. Um, I agree, but this is what some people look like when they're really, really angry. And, um, you know, if you've ever, uh, you know, been in this state, one of the ways to really re think about your you know your anger response is if someone were to videotape you if you ever uh you know are in a situation like that um you know it's maybe something your mom or dad can do where they just videotape you for a little bit and you can see yourself later and you might be shocked like what that's how i talk and that's how i look yeah, because when you're so angry, you're not aware of yourself. And that's the problem. You lose all control. So you can look really weird or like this person and just very, very uh, intense. But this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, if we want to remove uh, the effect of anger, remember, where does it come from? It's Iblis, right? Iblis is... Um, is the one who angers us. And that's uh, why we seek refuge in Allah from him. So someone's asking, smoke doesn't come out. Yeah, our smoke doesn't come out. We don't have that, but we do get hot and sometimes, uh, you know, sweaty. So that's kind of what it, it's like, you know, when you think of smoke from a boiling pot of water, right? It's, it's heat. Uh, so think of it that way, that we have heat that's coming out of us, right? So, um, but very important uh, hadith to remember, okay? So how do we, oh, so that, those are the treatments, excuse me. So now we're going to the last uh, one, which is ghafla, heedlessness, okay? Ghafla, this is a very uh, crucial one to understand, okay? A lot of the, some of the scholars say this is actually one of the root diseases to, um, to uh, all of the diseases of the, of the heart. So ghafla is purposely turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and it's, it's forgetfulness, but it's, it's like, you know, but you're just not, you want to do what you want to do. And there are people who, remember, we have will, we have free will. We have the choice, right, to do right or wrong. This is the test of the human being. So if you know what is halal and what's haram, and you know what's right and what's wrong, but you don't follow or, or obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you want to just do whatever you want to do, uh, this is ghafla, right? It's completely um, giving in to your own desires and turning away from Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many warnings about, um, about this. He says, and be not of the ghafilun, right? The heedless ones. And then he describes them. They are those upon whose hearts, hearing and sight, Allah has set a seal. And they are heedless. So because they turned away from Allah, Allah has turned away from them. And we never, may Allah protect us all from ever being amongst those who Allah ever turns away from or who we turn away from him, right? So, um, here is another really, uh, I think, powerful image because it teaches us the difference between those who remember their Lord. They're not forgetting Allah, right? They're remember remembering Allah. He says what? The Prophet ﷺ said that the example of the one who remembers his Lord in, in comparison to the one who does not remember his Lord is that of a living creature compared to a dead one. So when we look at this image, we see very clearly there is a living, vibrant, beautiful, life-giving, because trees give life, right? They give life to all the insects that are living on them. They emit oxygen for us to breathe. We give them our carbon dioxide. Uh, they're benefiting creatures. They're benefiting the earth. Uh, people find shade under the tree right? Uh, all these animals, uh, so much good comes from a living uh, tree, right? And that is the believer, the believer that remembers their Lord, so much good comes from them. Uh, they're beneficial to the world. The one who is not remembering Allah is basically like a dead tree that is in a desert 
and that really there's no benefit whatsoever from, all right? There's no benefit. Um, there's no shade, there's no fruits, there's nothing. It's just a dead uh, structure that stands in the middle of, a, of an arid, dry landscape. And um, it, it actually may even invite uh, the attention of vultures and snakes and other creatures that really are harmful. So all of this is to tell us that ghafla, which is the when you forget Allah, this is what it does. It makes you like a person uh, that is just of no benefit. You are actually even harmful uh, in many ways, right, to people and to the creation of Allah. So you are, uh, you have the choice. What is it going to be? Where would all of us rather be? If we could go into this picture, on which side would we rather be on, right? That's, I think, very clear. So um, this is, I thought, was a good visual for us to, to understand ghafla. Now, um, how do we treat ghafla? Allah subhanahu wa says, uh, warn them that on the day of regret, which is the day of judgment, when the matter will be concluded. On that day, everything's done, right? Uh, while now they're in a state of ghafla and they do not believe. So one of the treatments is to remind people that on the day of judgment, you know, that's it. You're, there's nothing you can do at that point. So, you know, you need to wake up from your sleepy state and uh, start to make toba, go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask for his forgiveness, uh, and, you know, start doing what you should be doing and warn people, you know, in this world before it's too late in the next. And then um, also remember that our prayers, our du'as are not answered, okay? So uh, here the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, call upon Allah with certainty that he will answer you. Know that Allah will not answer the supplication of a heart that is negligent and distracted, heedless. So the heart of a person who has ghafla is in this state where even their du'as will not be answered. Um, and so very important you want to be free from that and so again there are people who will say they're muslim right and i just want to explain there are people who are, will say that they're muslim but then they do not pray they may uh drink alcohol they may gamble they may do things that are explicitly haram uh, eat, you know, non-halal uh, foods. So these people, they know right from wrong. Um, they still say they're Muslim, but for some reason, they do not um, uh, prevent, or they don't do what they're supposed to do. They fall into sins, and they uh, become forgetful of their obligations to Allah. So this is the group of people we're talking about, right? That they know right from wrong, but they ch still choose to do wrong. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from protection from all of these diseases, that he protects us from ghadab, from uh, uh, ghish, from ghadab, and from, uh, from heedless as ghafla, okay? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. But this is uh, the class for today. Uh, we have one last class on Tuesday where we're going to be going over the rest of the diseases and it's going to be a lot so we're going to have to move very quickly next week to cover six diseases instead of three double the amount uh, but some of them do kind of overlap so with things that we've talked about before so inshallah we will um you know just try to move as quickly as we can but uh, are there any questions so i'm going to go ahead and stop the presentation and now we'll get to your questions inshallah Let's see, any questions? What about, very good questions. So I love this question. Thank you, Eamon, um, for asking. Eamon asked about fixing broken, broken things and selling them. There's nothing wrong. We call this refurbished. So if you have a refurbished item, that means it was broken, there was something wrong with it, it was old, but you went and you tried to uh, fix it, enhance it, make it working again. Um, as long as you are clear with the seller that this is not a new product, right? That it is something that you yourself maybe, or you had someone repair it, but that it's that it was broken and you've repaired it, 
that's there's nothing wrong with that the point of rish is that you're trying to hide those things you're actually not being clear with people you're purposefully hiding the flaws because you're afraid that if they know that it was broken they won't buy it so you're just not even going to tell them in the first place that's when it's fraud and that's when it's haram um what was the treatment for fraud? Did we, did I not go over that? I don't remember now if I, did I miss that one? I hope not. Um, let me see. I thought I went over it, but I think we talked about, yeah, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees all that you do, right? That nothing escapes his knowledge um, and that there's no benefit in ever taking uh, something that, uh, you know, consuming something that was bought or, t or, or uh, that you got from fraud, that it actually causes you harm. Okay. So if you, like I said, let's say you made $10,000 selling a, a car that had uh, engine, you know, damage that you didn't tell the buyer, you know, maybe it was in a car accident or there's a you know category of cars that are called salvaged okay a salvaged vehicle is a vehicle that was in a car accident or it was um taken by the government for some reason but it was it, there's something wrong with the car that it's not it's what we call a clean title it's not you know it has damage or prior history of damage those cars when you sell them if you're the seller you have to let the buyer know Oh, by the way, this car was a salvaged car. I, you know, I didn't get it from the from a car dealership brand new. I didn't buy it from one owner with no previous damage. This is the history of the car, and so um, you have to disclose that information because if you don't and you sell a car because from the exterior the car looked nice. Uh, and the person is like, oh, wow, this looks like a great car for this price. I'll get it. And then they go home. And then a month later, all of a sudden they're having engine problems. And now they have to spend thousands of more dollars to fix it. That is totally haram. And it's your fault because maybe had you told them, oh, by the way, this car had damage. They would have said, you know what? I don't think I want to buy it because I don't have the money in case it has more problems down the line. I need a good, reliable car. And then they go buy another car. So you have to just be honest, inshallah. Okay. Um, so we have, what if you judge someone, but you don't uh, mean to, but you accidentally always do it, but you don't mean to. Very good. I love that you asked that question, um, Captain, because anytime you have a disease in the heart that you don't uh, want to have and you are repulsed by it and you hate that you have it, this is a good sign. And so Allah will not hold you accountable for thoughts that you're trying your hardest to push away and that you're not happy about. So don't worry. That's not, that doesn't mean that you're a judgy person or you're a bad person. It's when you like to think about badly about people and you like to make judgments and you kind of just let your mind go off and on and on that's when it's a disease of the heart, okay? But if you're really struggling and you don't like it, but a thought keeps entering your mind, just say all the B'layim shaitan Shaitan and move on. Don't make it a big deal. Don't sit there and beat yourself up over it and go and say I'm a horrible person. No, because if you didn't have that thought uh, intentionally, then it was probably just waswasa from Shaitan because, you know, he likes to whisper and to make us think bad things. So don't worry, okay? Oh no, Kinza, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I hope you and your father and are safe. Um, someone shared that they were in, a, in an accident and I pray that you guys are all safe. Um, let's see here. If you're really poor, then are you allowed to deceive? No, uh, you cannot deceive people even if you're really poor. There's no theft. There's no begging uh, people. There's nothing fraud. No, none of it is permissible. Whether you're poor or rich, it doesn't matter. It's wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who provides. So if you're in need, we're supposed to turn to Allah. If you're hungry and poor, you turn to Allah and you ask him to provide for you. And he will. The money will come. The food will come. There are people all over the world who are homeless, who are poor, but they still eat every day or maybe every other day, but they eat and they still have something because Allah is the one who provides for them. Inshallah. Okay. Um, let's see. 
Oh, thank you, Lala. Very sweet. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday and you're very welcome. She thanked me for taking the time to do this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to be a part of this. You guys are so sweet. Um, okay, very good. Bilal asked this great question. Thank you, Bilal. You said earlier that rish leads to haram income. How can you purify your haram income? We talked about this um, when we talked about uh, miserliness and we talked about the importance of giving zakat and sadaqah and realizing that none of that um, diminishes your wealth. It doesn't take away from your wealth and it actually purifies your wealth. We also talked about it on um, what other disease? Remember when we did that washing? Now I'm forgetting my stuff. But when we did the washing of the clothing, um, fear of poverty. We talked about it when we talked about uh, we talked about how zakat and sadaqah purifies any haram wealth that you have. Okay. Yes. If you give sadaqah, it will purify your wealth, inshallah. For, you know, we shouldn't uh, knowingly have haram income, but if you don't know if maybe some of your income is haram, then that's the way to purify it, inshallah. Okay, um, let's see. I'm just wanting to make sure I get all the questions. There's a lot of comments coming here. Um, someone asked, what if a Muslim killed 100 people? Is he still a Muslim? Okay, well, there is a very famous hadith that actually speaks to that, um, where a man came, this was a long time ago, and he came to um, a, a Christian, you know, and he said, I have killed 99 people. I think it was a Christian. It might, well, I'm not sure actually, don't quote me on that. I think he was just a, a religious leader of his time and, and that time. But he said that he uh, you know, had killed 99 people. And so then he asked him, he said, I, I wanna be better. I'm a person, but I wanna get better. I wanna make Tawbah. I wanna you know, be, get close to God. Will your God forgive me? And that man said, no. He was like, nope you know, you're too, you've done too much evil. Um, there's no hope for you. Sorry. So the man was so overcome by his anger. And this is a good story because it relates to anger. He was so overcome by his anger again that he ended up killing that man. So now he's killed a hundred people. Eeks, right? This is a pretty awful person, right? In, in terms of what he's done. So he's killed a hundred people, but he makes, he wants to make Toba. He, he's not Muslim. He's never, uh, you know, uh, had good guidance before and he wants to become a better human being. So he goes and he finds a Muslim, uh, you know, and he asks him, he says, you know, can I, uh, or I want to become a better person. This is what I've done. Can I, will your God forgive me? And that man tells him, yes, but you have to leave this place that you're in because the place that you're in is not good. It's corrupt and it's part of the reason why you are, you've done all the bad things you've done. So go to this other place. And he told him where to go. And he said, over there are really good people and they will make you better. They're believers, right? They're Muslims. Muslim is a believer, right? They're, they're people that will make you better. So just go to those people. So he was so happy because he never thought that he could be forgiven for all of the crimes he'd done. And here someone gave him hope. So he was so excited that he ended up, you know, going uh, to that place. And on his way, something interesting thing happened. He died. Okay. So he dies. Now, when someone dies, there's two different angels that come. If they're a believer and they're a Muslim, uh, we, the angel of Rahmah comes, right? And that angel comes to take the soul. And then uh, the, if it's a non-believer or a bad soul, then the angel of torture comes. You know, there's different angels and they each have their own job. And so that person, because they're not destined for, you know, they, they, they were a bad person, uh, that angel takes them. So when they both come, they're like looking at each other like, huh? what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Because it's usually one or the other, not both. Um, and of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowing, uh, he's witnessing everything and he's, he's, he decides to send Jibreel alayhi salam to go and give them uh, you know, instructions on what to do because they don't know what to do. So when Jibreel alayhi salam comes, he, they explain to him what happened. And then he says, he says the order, the command is that you have to measure the distance from 
where the man was, like where the city that he was leaving from, to where he was going. And whichever place he was closer to, where he, he's passed away, he's died on the road, um, whatever place he was closer to, the angel will take him. So if he's closer to the place, the bad place, the angel of torture will take him. And if he's closer to the good place, the angel of mercy will take him. So um, they measured the distance and he was one hand span, so a whole distance of the hand, closer to the place that he left from. So at that point, the angel of torture was ready to go take his soul because that's what the command was. And then Angel Jabiru said, wait. And he said, I've been commanded to what? Do what? To constrict the earth. So that means he brought, he squeezed the lands together so that he was now closer to the place he was going. And then at that point, this is all from Allah, right? Because Allah can forgive anyone he wants to. And he saw the sincerity in this man that he wanted to be better and he wanted to be a Muslim, he wanted to be a believer. And so even though he was taken and his soul was taken before he could do all of those things, Allah still forgave him and he accepted him as a Muslim and the angel of mercy took him. So this story is related to us a lot of lessons that we can take from it, right? About anger and the danger of it, but also of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, to answer that question for the person who asked, um, Allah is the only one who can judge uh, us according to what we've done. And he's the only one who can forgive or not forgive. So it's entirely up to him. But that hadith uh, is specifically about someone who killed 100 people. So that's why I thought it was important to share it. Um, but thank you for asking. All right, you guys, we have gone over our time. And again, I apologize for uh, starting a little late. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for spending your, your afternoon uh, with me. Uh, we look forward to, the, to Tuesday's last class, inshallah. And uh, I, yeah, there's a lot to cover. So inshallah, we'll start on time. We might go a little bit over, let your parents know. Um, but thank you so much again. Oh, thank you, Captain. <laughs> Jazakallah khairan. I love having you in this class. Uh, may Allah reward all of you and increase all of you, inshallah. Uh, we will, um, thank you, Amen. Thank you so much again for your for your lovely comments and we need your du'as remember it's the last 10 days we need your du'as you guys your du'as are very powerful i'll take a child's du'as any day any day you give them to me i'll take them so please keep me and my family in your du'as all of you even though i don't know all of you personally you're still in my du'as because uh, you're beautiful children and i love children and i i pray that you and your families all of you that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of you and give you the best of this dunya and the next and that you have a most mubarak uh, remainder of your month inshallah have a wonderful evening and we'll we'll catch you guys on tuesday assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh